Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to present our six-month results. Um, I'm Bernard Johnson, the Group MD. For the six months to date, very challenging six months, up to the end of September, but we did have great results. The, uh, there were temporary sales opportunities, as I've, I've written down here, but the operational challenges were quite enormous. We managed to stick to our quality, service, and innovation mantra. We, we got through it and managed to take advantage of the, the temporary sales. However, the soaring temporary demand for hand sanitizers and hand washes just lasted three months. The market is now pretty much flooded with hand sanitizers and hand washes. But we increased sales on the back of securing 16 million pounds worth of orders for that, which we cleared through, as I said, with great difficulty. Uh, it was a challenge and demand has now faded for those. However, our NPD and sourcing met all our targets despite the limitations of capacity and COVID-19 pressures. We subcontracted, we put on a third shift, we did massive overtime, we are freighted goods from China, and we overmanned, quite honestly, but we did it. During that time, we invoiced, two months, we invoiced seven million a month, almost 50% more than we've ever done before. It was a traumatic time, but Post-July, the lower order intake took its toll due to lockdown. And so we immediately hit the reset button at the end of August to reduce overheads and direct costs. The thing I'm trying to convey is we got it. We kept in control all the way through, even though the pressures were enormous. The COVID-19 impact reduced direct margin by 2% at least. That uh, resulted from extra direct labor costs and SIF changeovers, lunch breaks, testing for COVID. We have our own testing both that we test for both antibodies and for the virus itself. We've now brought in the new testing kits, which, which give you a result in 45 minutes, and we find that very useful. But it does add extra costs to our direct labor and overheads. The overhead cost actually was probably resulted in about 35,000 a month and continues at that level. But the reset is working, and we're back on our original track which I will cover in the last slide. Now, I will hand over to Paul to do the finance. Hello, everybody. I've got a, a similar set of slides to last time. I'll talk a little bit more in the introduction on some points and then pick up on some of the other points as we go through the slides in detail. These are largely in line with the, the highlights that we put out this morning. Um, as, as Bernard mentioned, you know, revenues increased significantly, um, 8.6 million up on the previous period. We did start off with a relatively quiet first two months of the year, as you can imagine, as orders dropped and customers pushed back orders. But we very quickly responded to the change in demand. And that, as Bernard mentioned, quite a lot of increased cost as we changed the business, repositioned it, spent money on plant and equipment to be ATEX rated to a um, fill these high alcohol content products, et cetera, and then reposition the uh, production and capacity, outsourced, and put the third shift on. And we'll see the impact of some of those on the numbers later on in the slides. So there was some fall off in revenue on other areas, but more than compensated by the growth in the hygiene products. The gross margins fallen by about 2%. The underlying margins across the business, product range by product range, have held their own. Um, a lot of these costs have come from the points Bernard's raised already about the uh, increased costs associated with slowing production down initially until we got screens and other fact safety uh, procedures in place that could speed up production. A conscious decision not to bring in agency staff um, where we could flex production easily because of the risks that would bring into the business. And therefore, we've carried higher levels of uh, production labor than we would probably normally have done and not been able to flex those costs. Um, but there's a number of things we've done that have um, impacted the business in this period. Um, a big cost was air freight costs, bringing in uh, com components, some chemicals and some pumps from China in order to meet the demand. Um, whilst we did build that in, in initial cost into the price, we were hurt by the fact that freight rates went through the roof as everyone else was doing the same sort of thing. If you can cast your mind back to the scramble for PPE at that time. Um, we then um, also, may we've got a little bit of an increased stock provision. We've got relatively high 
stocks this year of uh, at the end of the period of these hygiene related products we've taken a cautious view on um, how quickly those will sell through at what price we'll be able to achieve that as the markets got swamped so so we've taken a little bit more cautious view on the the stock provision in the period um, a lot of these are going to be one-off items that we wouldn't expect to repeat in the second period um, that's delivered a profit before tax. I'll talk about overheads later on. Profit before tax increase of 1.1 million, 78%. This getting us um, a significant growth driven through to that margin, both as a profit after and before tax, which have both gone up to 8.9%, 7.5% respectively. Again, driving the overall metrics on the profit side of the business. Again, diluted earnings per share it increased 61% in that period. Um, 3.31 compared to 2.06 last year. I'm going to talk a little bit about the cash flow from operating activities later on, but we haven't seen that big significant increase in cash flow as you, you would have expected from that profit turnover. And that's partly because, as I mentioned earlier on, the earlier low sales levels, and as Bernard said, getting to 7 million later on in the period um, has had an impact on working capital, and I'll talk that through later on. Total caution has improved as you would expect, but we did take advantage of the March quarter of VAT deferment. So we haven't paid the March quarter, it was just shy of a million pound. We continue to pay you the VAT as it fell due, but we've chosen to delay the March 20 quarter and we'll pay that in March 21. We paid the final dividend in the period that uh, we talked about in later on in the year, and we're proposing a flat dividend again on the interim level at the moment and um, we'll make a decision on the final dividend once we see the results at the end of the year. So going into the slides, a little bit more detail. The revenue, you can see the graphs, the steady trend up in the period, and the 32 million in the six months, 36% increase compared to 23.8 last year, and exceeds the figure we did six months ago, um, in the six months, in the full year, five years ago. The higher sales of the hygiene partly offset by the private label slowdown in customer orders. We've lost no customers. Some customers have deferred. As you can imagine, some of the customers, their stores have been shut. Some of our contract customers, the people like Molten Brown, etc., will have had delay sales as their, their opportunities to sell through have fallen away. That's meant a, a fall off in call off on those orders. We are seeing that picking up as we go through the year. And um, depending on how COVID shutdowns go, in the new year, I suspect, um, will have some impact on how the second half comes out. So we made the, the most of the opportunity in the period is the crux of that. And the fact that we were able to deliver on the NHS contract was a significant bonus. Pre-tax profits have increased by 63%. Again, the operational leverage falling through. But we have increased distribution costs higher than we would like. And that's partly because of the stock levels. Um, our warehouses have been full even before this, and we used third third party warehousing as we brought in more stocks. An increased proportion of the stock has been held off site at third party warehouses, incurring costs that um, were higher than higher than we would have liked in the period. But they were a function of uh, of meeting the demand. Um, administration costs have gone up by fourteen point eight percent. A lot of those are operational related. Uh, again related to staffing in warehouses, related to picking works orders, supporting the night shift and the increased activity, just moving things around, consumable costs that go up in line with the increased output. Um, so those will vary again as we go through the period. About 320,000 of those admin costs were specifically related to COVID, the costs of the testing kits, the people carrying out the testing, the increased cleaning we've carried out on the site. The, the security we put on the gates to make sure that everyone who comes on site is tested before they access the site. So a lot of those things that have helped keep the site secure and ensure that we've been able to deliver the results are in those admin costs. Moving on to the next slide, the profit margins. You can see the two graphs there showing the upward trend for the last four or five years as we've gone through delivering the aspirational target of 10% um, that we've set out a few years ago. We're still working towards those, even though we've had a deep impact on the margin in this period, the operate profit before tax is considered going up. Tax charge is increased slightly compared to last year, and that's primarily a function that the we anticipate the R&D tax relief um, will remain relatively static year on year, 
and, and therefore the tax rate, underlying tax rate, will go up, um, go up slightly compared to with the increased growth in profit. It's purely a function of that. And again, the diluted earnings per share on the final slide, just showing that from a shareholder perspective, 3.31p um, per share compared to 1p 2017, just illustrates how far the, the company has come in that uh, six, six month on six month in four years. I, I did say I wanted to talk a little bit about working capital, a bit of a busy slide this, but really what I want to concentrate on is the decrease, and it's a straight extraction from the cash flow, but what I wanted to concentrate on is the decrease, increase in working capital, which you can see we've increased our investment in working capital of 3 million um, compared to September last year, where we actually had a reduction in working capital. And there you can see that we've increased stocks by for 1.8 million, 1776. Receivables have increased by 4.2 million, partly offset by payables, including that VAT of, of 2, 2.9, nearly 3 million. So we've had a significant increase in working capital as we've grown to expand and cope with the business. The, the biggest element of that increase is within the receivables. And that is primarily a function of the growth in the business towards the latter end of the year. Although it looks like a big figure, if we move on to the next side, you'll see that our debtor days are actually slightly lower than last year. But the increased activity in the last few months, together with the VAT added on top of that, of course, um, has driven up that investment in the debt trade receivables. Um, so, so we're not lost control. We've managed debtors. The period has been very difficult uh, managing some of the debtors. As you can imagine, some customers lost their revenue stream almost totally. Um, and we've managed carefully with customers their um, their expectations. We, one of the increases in the overheads was a conscious decision to ensure our total debtor book through this period. Um, in the past, we've... Uh, tended not to insure some of the blue chip customers. So the only debtor on our debtor book that we have uninsured now is the Department for Health and Social Care. Um, every other day, a customer either train, trades within credit lim insured credit limits or um, on a pro forma basis. So we're managing um, our debtor risk very carefully through these uncertain times. Um, and that has come with a small cost to the business in terms of increased share, um, insurance premiums. Um, stocks have increased by 24.4% um, compared to the 2019 levels. As we mentioned, that's compared to a 30 odd percent increase in sales. Um, and you know, when we look on a historic basis, that stock turn has improved by 4.6 times compared to 3.8 times. Slightly less of improvement if we look on our forecast levels, um, and hence why we've been a little bit more prudent on some of our stock provisioning. Um, we have increased creditors uh, in line with that. Um, we've had to pay more proportion of our creditors early, um, primarily because we import some more items, particularly plastic pumps to do with hygiene products from the Far East. Um, and the payment terms there mean that money goes often before we've received the goods. So, so that's reduced the credit today slightly. Um, but all in all, I think what it shows is despite all of these problems, we have kept control of our assets. We kept control of our stock, probably not as well as we would have liked, but um, and, and um, but, but certainly we've kept control of debtors. We've managed the risks associated with our customers in the early periods um, and are coming out in a strong position with a high um, with the opportunity to reduce stock in the second half and also the high cash intake to come in from the debtors that are on the debtor books at the end of end of September. So we should see some of that um, that, that working capital investment we've seen in the period unraveling in the second half. So that's all I've got to say today, and um, I'll pass over to Pippa Clark now. Afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll now take you through the sales and marketing aspect of our business. Just want to start with some context um, of some very up-to-date data on the impact on the UK market, the health and beauty market, as a result of COVID. There is a prediction that the cosmetics and toiletries market will decline about 10% during the calendar year 2020. Uh, there are a couple of categories that have been hit harder than most. Um, two categories that fortunately we do not do significant business in. So fortunately have not hit us as hard as it has maybe some other brand owners and contract manufacturers. And that is color cosmetics 
down 24% and fragrances down 19 The premium sector, obviously, within that has been hit particularly hard. It's the travel sector and travel retail that has really been a driver in, in losses in those categories and in the premium sector. Skincare, personal care and oral hygiene, though, have all gained in the period and proven very well. And there's been some very specific product gains within skincare, for example, face masks and treatments, of which we have quite a significant proportion in both our branded and private label businesses. And then nail polish and hair colorants, not two areas that we are currently involved in, but just gives a flavor of the type of products that the consumer has been seeking during this lockdown and COVID period. The good news is that the the predictions are is that the UK market is set to return to growth during 2021. It's a very resilient sector um, because of the the agility of the sector, the innovation that's driven by both brand and private label, and that it's very consumer centric. The consumer responds very, very quickly in this sector. So the positive news is that they expect global growth for 2021 to be at plus 6%, considering how hard it's been hit during 2020. So the future does look very positive as soon as we come through this COVID period. An interesting stat that's come out is Amazon. We all know that Amazon has been the big beneficiary through this whole period um, across multiple categories. They have never had a very large share of the beauty market, but they have increased that to 6% during lockdown. Um, And that was just during the three month period of the very tight lockdown of April to June of this year. And obviously, we need to keep a strong eye on that one, because now that they've really got some momentum behind them, of which the pandemic has helped to fuel, I don't doubt that that is going to continue on quite a strong trajectory over the next um, coming six months and 12 month period. And then something that's important to note is that 25 percent of UK consumers are now earning less than they did pre-COVID. So the value message is really, really important in FMCG and uh, particularly so within within health and beauty. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a a little while. So a breakdown of our performance by the three divisions that we have, brands that we own, private label and contract, compared to um, the first half last year, shows quite a significant difference in how things have shifted in the six-month period. So brands has been responsible for 53% of our total revenue during the six months. 17% of which is our core brands, 36% of which is hygiene, predominantly through our pure touch brand. So an increase of 233%. Private label accounted for 33% in the period with a 10% loss. And the biggest hit category, mainly because of the premium brands that we service, was contract manufacturing during the period, now down to 14% of our total business revenue with a 37% loss from the first half last year. Also wanted to show you what that might look like if you took the hygiene out of the equation. It would mean brand is up at 26%, which is still a 6% share increase of our total business, 14% increase in terms of the movement. Private label would be at 52% and contract at 22%. So you can see that the impact of COVID and us very quickly and agilely moving into um, hand sanitizers and hand washes has had a significant impact on sales during the period. So just to support some additional commentary on those shares of our business. So private label lockdown versus post lockdown. It was the biggest category that was hit from day one in terms of cancellation of orders. We had in the region of about three and a half million pounds worth of orders either cancelled or pushed back or lost um, because of their their EPOS related due to high street closures. That predominantly came from two big UK high street customers. Um, So a big impact, as Paul indicated, for April and May in terms of our sales performance. The positive news is that private label has responded very positively and very quickly um, as soon as all of those store openings were happening. And one of the things through that period that was very strong for us is that grocery and the value sector did not skip a beat. We obviously do a significant amount of private label in grocery and the grocery discounters, and that really held up its own right from the beginning of of March all the way through. The consumer is now definitely seeking quality products at value prices. And you will see that private label over the future period is is really coming into its own. It's definitely a priority for retailers right now. Um, They are having a fight with national brands on pricing. Uh, You've got some of the grocers that are wanting to apply EDLP pricing and do less promotions. So they're having a bit of a battle with some of the big national brands. 
one of the solutions they always have when that kind of tension happens is to move into private label. And that is definitely a, a move that, that all of them are making at the moment in lots of categories in health and beauty. The other thing that's also driving private label is um, a number of factors that are happening in the market, not just COVID, but Brexit with some onshoring happening with manufacturing, but also social responsibility seems to be a key driver in very, very recent weeks and months, uh, particularly with anything that's made out in China. So social responsibility agendas are coming through very strongly, particularly with the grocers, which is showing us um, some opportunities in private label that we haven't seen in some time, which is gonna be very interesting moving forward. In terms of hygiene, as um, Bernard and Paul have both touched on, the lockdown peak, we um, pivoted very quickly and bought our Pure Touch brand to market. It's a brand that we had in our stable of dormant brands that we traded for some time during the SARS epidemic. Um, we pulled out of it quite quickly afterwards because that category is incredibly um, tight in terms of margin and retail. But it did, it was in our stable of brands. So very quickly we could pull that out and we were able to get it to market very, very quickly. Um, not just in terms of winning a sizable contract with the NHS, but also in retail. So over 50% of what you saw in terms of our increase in hygiene was through retail. And that was working very closely with people like uh, Little Boots and Superdrug specifically. Post lockdown, which is the period that we're in now, there is definitely hygiene fatigue in terms of PPE on the retail market and in the NHS. There is complete and utter oversupply for both gels and hand washes. And that is not just in retail. The NHS obviously went out and issued contracts extensively to those that could provide the quality and the service very quickly to them. And as a result, they've oversupplied quite significantly. There is definitely a fatigue in the market at the moment with regard to hygiene products. And retailers are, just to support my earlier point, are wanting to move hygiene into private label options. Um, so whilst we've had some success with the Pure Touch brand in retail, and you may have seen it quite extensively in a number of retailers throughout the UK, the opportunities are now coming to us for private label in this category versus brand. Definitely been a slowdown of premium brand demand, which has had the impact on our contract division. As I highlighted earlier, that has mainly been the travel retail sector, which has affected a lot of those brands that have traditionally traded very successfully in travel retail. Those that were well-equipped and well-placed to take advantage of online during the period have continued to stand up quite well. Um, but obviously, others have also lost out with the likes of the big department stores not performing where they have traditionally had listings. So the focus really throughout that whole period for us has still been with winning retailers. Um, so we were focusing on those retailers like grocers, discounters, and discounted retailers. So as some of our high street partners and customers were closing down with, with four stores closures, we, twist, we moved ourselves to ensure that we were servicing the grocers and the value sector well during the period. I wanted to give you a flavor of the category performance. This is actually six months on six months as opposed to half year on half year. And the reason I wanted to show you that was really the impact of, of COVID in terms of buying habits. As you can see, hygiene was a category that didn't really exist for us previously. <laughs> and has been quite significant in the period. Facial skincare um, has done very well and continues to stand up very well, both in brand, contract manufacturing, and private label. Body skincare has been a very interesting category, particularly with regard to derma brands and dry skin, uh, has done very well with some of the retailers. Hair care took about a 20% hit across the board, and that included with our numbers, has always been a significant category for us. With people being at home, it was one of the product usage categories that people would, were not purchasing as frequently. That has started to come back quite strongly. And in fact, in, with some of our key retailers, particularly some of our key branded retailers, we're back to the pre-COVID numbers on hair care. Baby stood up very well during the period. And then you can kind of see the impact on others. I think the most significant um, category <laughs> that declined during the period, not just for us, because it's quite a small category for us, but across the UK was male grooming. Um, for some reason in the UK, the male contingent of our population stopped using health and beauty products, almost completely in some of the subcategories. Um, but again, when we look at the numbers um, over the past couple of months, that is starting to come back. 
So in terms of private label, the biggest impact for us was lockdown of, of stores having to close, particularly High Street. And it had quite a significant impact on our sales for the first couple of months of lockdown. That said, as I've already highlighted, the grocers and the discounters have stood up really well um, and haven't really dropped a ball during the entire period, which has been very positive. We have still had wins with key international retail partners in private label during the period, which has been very positive, particularly in the baby care category. And we continue to focus on margin enhancing value add categories, particularly skincare, baby care, added value bath and shower, and as it's coming back, hair care and very much well-being. I'll talk a bit more about well-being a bit later. Innovation and speed to market is still very important for private label. In fact, probably even more so than it has been because of the slowdown in lockdown with some of the retailers. They're now coming back in force with briefs on private label and wanting to move to market very, very quickly to make up that gap. And we continue to be award winning in private label, um, still very much high on the agenda for us with key customers in terms of ensuring that quality service and innovation mantra that we apply to all of our key businesses. I want to take the opportunity to highlight which of our brands have performed very well for us during the six month period. As highlighted, we brought back Pure Touch very quickly to the market to service that hygiene demand and PPE demand that was happening both in the health service and in retail. Balance Active Formula, which was the brand that we purchased about 18 months ago in the skincare category, has done incredibly well for us. Uh, we've added about a million pounds onto the brand in terms of trade during that 18 month period and still is going from strength to strength with new listings and new MPD that's coming out very shortly. Feather and Down did very well during the period. The well-being message and the sleep message that Feather and Down has as a brand resonated very, very well with UK consumers during lockdown. And if you like the anxiety and the frustrations that the lockdown period brought to consumers um, and the general public, um, Feather and Down has performed very well for us during the period, as has Body Bliss. Um, we took advantage, obviously, of the hand wash aspect of Body Bliss and traded that quite heavily into multiple retailers um, where we have not had opportunities with the brand before. But the main driver with Body Bliss during this period has actually been relaunched into two major international markets, and it's doing very well for itself in those two markets, which is very positive. E-commerce, which is an area that we, of course, now in today's age cannot ignore. It's a key part of getting product to market, particularly within health and beauty. For the six-month period up to September, it was one of the areas that we did not put a priority on in light of the challenges that we were having with main bricks and mortar retailers, with supply chain, and with managing everything that was happening with regard to the trade opportunities we had with the health service. That said, some of our products did very well online, the hygiene and well-being ones particularly. So that would have been pure touch and feather and down in the main. However, Google very quickly, due to the amount of gel brands and gel products that came onto the market, started putting embargoes on selling gel products through the Google platform, which had a significant impact on our sales of uh, PPE products through um, online platforms by not being able to use Google um, and for some of our competitors. That said, we still have achieved 180% sales uplift uh, this half of the year versus the last half of the year on our digital sales. So digital sales for us is really about the next six months and how we take it forward over the coming years. It is definitely a, a number one priority for us. What we have spent the time doing during the six month period is sorting out the operational side of the potential that we think we have on um, an e-commerce platform by sorting out a specialist third party pick and pack operation, by sorting out our forecasting for e-com, our planning and operations are now in place so that we can service e-com more effectively and more efficiently and hopefully with a lot more success in terms of sales growth. The other thing that we've done during this six month period along with the challenges of ensuring that we were delivering to existing customers is that we've focused on changing gear with Amazon, uh, with both vendor and seller platforms and recognizing the titan that they are in terms of being able to trade some of our brands successfully with them over the coming months. And then the other key focus that we have is to extend our product offer. Um, another key learning for us through the period is that we um, need to offer more differentiated product formats and product types 
to really ensure that our e-commerce platform driving forward is going to be successful. We have also brought in a new head of e-commerce that started on the 1st of September. Um, he comes with a pedigree of building a very successful health and beauty brand online, quite significantly from about 1.5 million to in excess of 20 million over about a four year period. Um, so he definitely comes with some great expertise and learnings in terms of how we can definitely accelerate what we're doing online over the coming six to 12 months. For those of you that have attended these presentations before, you would have seen this slide from me before. There really is little change from the presentation that we presented a couple of months ago, because this is all still very much our key focuses in terms of how we're driving the business forward. Um, one of the most significant things that has, has happened, though, in the past six months is we actually have invested in a sales team in terms of building a bit more muscle into that team. We've got three new business development managers on the branded side of our business, which is really gearing us up to really do a, a significant sales push on our brands in the coming months. So that's a very exciting development for us over the past six months. As you know, I talk a lot about partnering with winning brands and retailers. That is still very much the case and was still very much the case as we were moving ourselves through the pandemic challenges. As I highlighted earlier, we really put priority on those customers that were open. We put priority on those customers where um, consumers were actually shopping, ensuring that our branded stocks, for example, were taking priority in those customers, that our manufacturing priorities in private label were with those customers that were actually winning during that time period. So whilst, if you like, that's almost a micro example of a, a few months period of what we do, it demonstrates that's how we focus our business. Um, and I think that's that's definitely a winning strategy for us. Key account growth continues. We still want to be able to do more in gifting and actually have done more in gifting during the period and will continue to do more gifting moving forward. Well-being is still a big focus for us. Feather and Down has done very, very well during the period, both online and in stores, and will continue to be a, a brand that we will continue significant investment in. Bar Soap, again, we've won a number of contract opportunities during the period for Bar Soap, which has been really quite interesting. I highlight fragrance because for us, it is still a category that we do well. It's a nice margin category. It's a category that we would like to be a key focus, but it is very depressed currently. Um, I do anticipate that that will come back during 2021, particularly into the seasonal buys of 2021 uh, towards the end of the summer next year and into next Christmas. But it definitely is a depressed category at the moment, again, because of people's lifestyles changing and working from home and being at home. Um, new distribution channels for us has, has definitely extended in that now that we have a sales team with some muscle in our branded area, we are now have got the opportunity to move into areas like convenience um, and into um, e-commerce with other e-commerce retailers. Um, that includes Amazon, obviously, as a key national account. Global market focus still is, is key for us, but it's changed slightly insofar as that we have put the USA on hold for a period of time. As you will all be, um, I'm sure, fully aware, investment into the US for anybody that's going in and launching brands is significant. That is a market in turmoil at the moment. Um, two of our big customers that we have out there um, literally shut down and, and uh, canceled all orders in April. Um, it's a very brutal market in that respect, in the terms of the way that they do business. So it has dropped off our agenda for the immediate future, and it's one we're continuing to watch. Germany very much stays at the top of our agenda, and the Middle East is doing very well. And as Eamon will highlight um, in, a, in a bit of a presentation he's going to do towards the end, is the impact of Brexit and, and the business that we're doing in Europe. Obviously, there is a positive impact on UK manufacture, but there, there is a, an impact that we see potentially on um, exporting, or rather importing into the EU market. And as I've already highlighted specifically, ongoing digital development. Again, a slide that I presented a couple of months ago at our year end results, just to see what, you know, give you a flavor for what was happening. All of this is still true. I've just added a bit of an update in terms of what's happened in the past couple of months. Um, things that are definitely on the up, hygiene and healthcare, well-being and self-care, skin care, as I've already highlighted, hair treatments and colorants, and that's really about DIY beauty at home, direct-to-consumer, convenience shopping has definitely come to the forefront. You've probably seen the results coming out from people like Musgrave and people that 
own the spa franchises and the co-op in terms of how well they've performed during the period. And the dynamic that re when we talk to our high street retailers, they have less consumers going into store because people are at home and they're venturing out less, but they are spending more whilst they're in store. So that's quite interesting in terms of how we're working with retailers on our brands and private label with the types of promotions that we're doing, the types of pickup products and impulse products that we're putting at till point to take advantage that once people are in store, they are willing to spend. Um, high street department stores still very much depressed and you would have seen what's happened in the market recently with Debenhams. Global supply chains are still stressed, not stressed to the extent that they were um, at the very peak of lockdown where getting hold of certain components and raw materials was very challenging, but stressed now insofar as that lead times are still very extended. And that includes UK. Um, there is definitely a stress in the UK supply chain, particularly with components where traditionally we've had six to eight week lead times on key components and they're now stretched out to 10 to 14 weeks in some cases. Um, so there has definitely been a complete shift in how we're trying to manage stock and order profiles in terms of trying to successfully manage supply chain. Fragrance still very much depressed as a category. Color cosmetics, male grooming and big brand MP, MPD definitely took a hit at the beginning of lockdown and for the six months that we're referring to. Um, but I've I've highlighted them and asterisked them because they are coming back um, quite significantly in some areas. So de definitely key areas to watch as, it, as, as we move forward and hopefully move out of COVID into the spring of next year. Um, so the brand consumer relationship during this period has completely and utterly changed. The way that brands need to communicate with the consumer is, is, has evolved and become quite sophisticated. Um, and that is the online piece. There is now an opportunity to tell a story to the consumer and those brands that are winning are ones that have a very strong story and are looking to connect with the consumer um, in a way that the consumer is attached to and is excited by what a brand has to offer them, not just in terms of the product that it's delivering, but in terms of the story that it's telling. And I think that we're very well placed with brands like Feather and Down in the well-being space, Bam Beautiful in the well-being space. I consider Balance Active with the skincare SKUs to be in the well-being space. There's some really nice stories behind each of those brands that we're harnessing as we move forward. Agility is absolutely winning. Um, value performance products are very much at the top of the agenda. And as always with us, it's all about providing solutions. And I think hopefully we've demonstrated over the past six months that that is still very much at the heart of what we do along with our quality service and innovation, that the minute that something is challenged in the market, we, our first instinct is to provide a solution to that market, both the retailer and the consumer. So something I've just added on to kind of show you how these trends are manifesting themselves in the market, derma brands are absolutely on the up. So anything to do with dry skin, problem skin, skin conditions, are definitely on the up. You would have probably seen some big national brands that have started advertising on television quite significantly and getting quite some, some significant store space in the places like Boots and Superdrug. So derma brands are definitely one to watch. Home spa is a huge trend. Um, Bath and Body has taken a bit of hit during the period, but not when it's couched as a spa brand and a self-treat and a self-care type of product. So actually, if you like, Mastige products in the high street have done quite well in this space during the period. DIY beauty, definitely very much a key focus. That's where the hair treatment and colorants come from. And I think even though it's not a key category for us, it's one to keep an eye on in terms of what kind of innovation will come through the market. And I think that will probably trickle into other categories as well and definitely into skincare. And I think something that's very interesting is everybody was saying that people were buying less during lockdown in this category. And to a certain extent, that was true in the very early days. But what has happened very quickly is that we now have this excess happening. So whilst some consumers have, are stripping back and maybe buying less and using less, you have another consumer that actually is buying to excess. And they're buying to excess as a means of escapism. They're trialing more, they're experimenting more, they're willing to try more new product development, and they're using more product as a way to escape 
um, if you like, the boredom and the kind of day-to-day -day, um, limitations that are in their their day-to-day -day lives currently with not being able to visit spas and beauty salons and hairdressers. So they're finding another outlet. So it's a very interesting dynamic that's happening in the market, both stripping back and excess use. I'm going to hand you over to Eamon, who is going to take you through a summary of Brexit and the implications for our business moving forward. Thanks, Pippa. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, what I'd like to do just in this Brexit section is to just provide some context uh, for Brexit and what it means to our business. It's very much a work in progress. Hopefully we might know a little bit more after tonight's dinner. Um, but what I've tried to do on this first slide here is just, just really to put, put some of the Brexit discussions in a context. So if you look at the top of the left, first of all, the first issue to talk about is market access. Um, so as we know, in the event of, of no deal, uh, duty may apply on EU traded items. So typically, we're in the range of around about zero duty to 6.5% duty. So for example, on our, on our supply chain, if, if we bring in goods from Europe, we could pay duty of somewhere in that range. It's uh, relatively significant in our business, um, but we're not, for example, as bad as the food industry, where they're looking at tariff rates much higher than that. So our response to those potentially higher duties would be obviously there will be, there will be a customer discussion if and when these duties land about how they're going to be absorbed within the uh, supply chain and how, to, how the market is going to deal with those. Um, and I think probably one trend that's worth highlighting, we've started to see it, and we will certainly see more of it in the future, is the whole area of local sourcing, you know, where more and more of the, of the manufacturing, the componentry supply, the sourcing will be brought back into the UK. So we've seen that started to happen, and I think it will be an inevitable trend as we move through Brexit and beyond. The second issue really to look at is supply chain. Now this is this has got a lot of press and commentary over the over well, since Brexit was conceptualized. And we know for sure uh, there is delays in the supply chain. We see them every day. We read the news announcements even even last night with the Honda delay. And there's no doubt in the short term, certainly supply chains are going to be challenged. So what we've done in response within our business, internally we've appointed additional resource. Uh, externally, we've appointed a, a customs broker to help us navigate our way through this new period. Uh, we also have professional advisors from, from our professional VAT, uh, indirect taxes, uh, corporate structure, just to help us navigate our way in the best possible way through this. And we've also taken on, and we've seen some evidence of it in the accounts, additional storage, additional warehousing, uh, and made really more time within our supply chains to deal with the expected uh, delays in our supply chain. The third one, the one in the middle, I just call this legal, regulatory, um, and for sure, um, the legal area will be more complicated and more complex as we move post-Brexit. Um, and what we need to ensure and put in place is that all our products are comply, obviously, with UK legislation, which they do, but also they need to comply with the relevant EU regulations. And uh, in, order for, in order for us to achieve that, we have uh, established new subsidiaries in Republic of Ireland and in Germany. We've modified our packaging to include EU contact details and ensure we comply with uh, EU regulations. And we've also done an amount of work to make sure that our products are technically compliant, for example, uh, with regard to the REACH regulations. Um, moving on to the next one, which is our customers. Um, it's interesting, if, if I was presenting this slide probably four weeks ago, uh, we, we, would, we would have had very little uh, demands, questions, concerns from our customers. I think everybody was waiting really to see what, what was going to happen. And certainly over the last probably four to six weeks, uh, the customers have basically um, probably made up their own mind about Brexit and what they need to do. And we certainly have seen addi additional customer requests and demands about, you know, could we expand our terms? Uh, for, for example, could we do DDP, delivery duty paid in certain certain circumstances? Could we change the nature of, of, of the relationship? And really, in short, they were asking us to, to do a little bit more to help them out 
uh, to get through the Brexit process and to get into the new situation. So in terms of what are our responses to these customer requests, um, we certainly are geared up, as you can see in the legal and the compliance light, to be able to take on those requests. We, we, we can import into Europe. We have, will be legally and technically compliant. So we, so we will be able to accommodate customer requests. Um, but we see it also as an opportunity to build a strategic partnership with certain export customers in Europe. So that's certainly in, in the, uh, a positive development as far as we're concerned. And the last box of called opportunity and for sure that everything to the left, market access, supply chain, legal, some of those customer requirements, they're complicated, they're difficult things, but they're part of doing business pro post Brexit. Um, but I think it's worthwhile just concentrating on the opportunity because we've already started to see it that Brexit is going to happen. Uh, it's, it's a fact, uh, but for sure it is going to present new opportunities for UK businesses who are on the lookout for new opportunities. And really what the message that we have said to customers and potential customers is that we want to be a credible UK-based manufacturing partner um, to businesses who want to do business in the UK. And we've already had a number of inquiries in that regard, and it's probably... If we were to look forward in terms of opportunities, we certainly see it uh, a trend towards more UK sourcing and um, manufacturing capability and capacity coming back uh, to the UK uh, to overcome some of the challenges that we've seen in, in regards to market access and supply chain. So it isn't all, it's challenging in Brexit for sure. There will be costs. There's an, an overarching uh, uncertain macroeconomic picture, but for sure within Brexit, uh, there will be opportunities. Just really to summarise that opportunity, I think probably the message really that I'd like to say, and, and certainly from the point of view of our business, is that we're open for business. So that's all for me. So I'd like to hand back to Bernard. Uh, thank you, Eamon. Thank you, Pippa. Thank you, Paul. So basically, I want to summarise here. Um, we've had a six months, which in, in football terms or football analogy, has been a game of two halves. The first half has been the market was flooded with demand for hygiene products. There was a need, demand, everything had to be focused on it. We did that. And then in August, boom, everything, everything went quiet. No further demand. So we did meet the demand in the first three months. And despite huge costs, overhead costs, direct costs, COVID costs, we extracted a profit, which has filtered through, but it gave us the opportunity to hit the reset button and get back into the 442 formation. So we started to muscle build our sales team, both at premium level, at mass and value. So we're focusing now on drugstore chains and garden centers with a wider range of gifting, soap and fragrance products and well-being products, particularly led by Father and Don which has been extremely successful. On mass, we consolidated our success with key high street retailers. I refer to our historic success over the years. We're well placed with them to increase our gift and well-being offerings. Our brands are strong and building. On the value side, we are targeting a wider spectrum of customers, including, as Pippa has said, convenience and the lower level garden centers, customers such as the range, uh, which has come into prominence recently. And in all of those areas, customers are seeking quality products at value prices. It's just what we're really good at. We would also like, as we have done in the past with Balance Active, for example, purchase a really good brand. We're prepared to extend our finances to do that, whether it's, it's equity or borrowings or whatever. But it, it, it would need to also have a strong digital base. And I think there are one or two out there uh, available and we will hunt them down. But our reset button has been that we've now, we're now after that huge rush in the first three, four months up until the end of August, we couldn't focus on these things. Now we're well placed to get back in and get back on the mainstream of our business. On contract manufacturing, just to continue on the same theme, we re refocused on the big brand winners, including big digital retailers. There are quite a few out there when you start to get into it. And I think we have got the perfect offering for them. On private label, we continue, as Pippa has said, we continue to ride the wave. 
the retailers are getting back by increasing their offerings on on, on own brands, as are digital retailers, and we can exploit that. I'm not sure what, whether we want to exploit COVID or not, but we will exploit our brands. In operational terms, we kind of were interrupted for a, a little while by COVID. We bought the site about 18 months ago. We intend to build warehousing and take back our third party picking and packing 3PL. That will reduce our overheads, increase our efficiency and secure our service to our customers. On the operational side, we're focusing on automation and artificial intelligence on the production floor and on the manufacturing floor, blending, filling and manufacturing. Probably at least a million pounds worth of investment of your money and our money, but I think it will be well spent and will give a good return. We're improving our management systems as well in planning, ERP and financial. So really refocusing now after a huge, huge pressure of the first three or four months of this COVID era, which coincided with our last six months of business up until the end of September. So our aspirations, actually, we were always aiming to achieve 60 million by the end of 2021. And I think we will do that with ease. Unfortunately, probably due to COVID, which is a nasty, nasty awful thing but um, we have come out uh, on the on the on the positive side of that our net income will be seven percent and our ROC will be above 20 percent in terms of further aspirations right out to 2024 we've set ourselves a target of 100 million turnover with a net income of nine percent and a continuing minimum ROC of 20 percent uh, we'll maintain the current level of dividend throughout by setting these targets uh, as aspirations, we we find ourselves in a position to drive the business forward and actually achieve them. Part of that target of the 100 million will be 25 million of web-based business. And I couldn't detail that plan right now, but I know we will get there. We have started that process and that is our target. And we usually achieve our targets, 25 million in three years time, at least. I suppose I just want to end on a positive note here in the midst of a, a terrible crisis and pandemic. We're still moving along the mantra of quality, service and innovation. And in doing that, I'd like to remind you, highlight, I have to remind myself every day that we have one of the best product development teams, I think, in the UK on this particular sector of the business. And we're completely consumer driven. Our, our quality, innovation and service continues to work well for us. We've great brands across hair care, skin care and bathing. And we just need to continue to improve our selling machine to get the best return. We're not doing too badly, but we intend to do a lot better. With our strong marketing and sales team, we're continuously improving our sales team, and we will continue to do so. We're generating cash. We're spending it on stocks as we develop the business, but we are fundamentally a cash-generating machine. And we intend to use some of that, to, as I've said before, purchase brands. We're investing in capacity, automation, artificial intelligence, and warehousing. We're upgrading the management systems and continue to upgrade the digital platform. We will seriously do that in the next two years. And I just wanted to highlight that. Probably this is the fifth time you've heard it in this little presentation, but all these things are so important to us, and I think we will succeed in doing them. So that's the end of our presentation. We're now open for questions. And we have a question from Leo Hendry, who says, is the increase in receivables mostly related to the NHS PPE contract? And what payment terms are they on? It, it's entirely driven by activity, but actually the payment terms on the NHS contract are better than our normal average. Um, it's just the certain customers are... Um, uh, um, where we had growth in sales, have longer terms. So overall, the, the mix really of debtor days has not changed. It is purely driven by activity. Um, and some of that is Christmas gift related rather than just being um, um, where we've had increased sales on Christmas gift related products. So it's a mixture, but it's largely activity related, which in the last four months of the year has been, uh, the growth has been hygiene product related. Yeah. I suppose the sales in the last two months, Paul, were, were, yeah, very, were quite high. 
Thank you. Um, we have a question from Alan Charlton. First of all, I'd certainly like to congratulate the team. I think given the um, size of the rock thrown in your pond, this has been a remarkable result in the, the first half. And yeah, my many congratulations. I'm not surprised at all, having grown to know you a bit and seen you dance on the head of a pin before, but it's been a very impressive performance. Um, my question actually is related to the, obviously we brought the freehold back of the, the Peterborough site. And I know you referenced in the presentation about um, potentially building out the warehouse so we can repatriate um, from third party suppliers. Um, my question is really, I suppose, three parts is, when do we look to do that? Uh, how long does it take? Um, how much does it cost? And what sort of payback do we think we'll get on it in terms of improved margins? How quickly will we be able to repay the capital? Good question. Good question. Uh, we, at the moment, are focused on building uh, temporary warehousing, which will give us an extra uh, probably 10,000 square feet, which will be enough to Re, re, repatriate the uh, third party picking and packing. The long term uh, aim is to build a, a, a 20,000 square feet, uh, it, you know, a state of the art warehouse, which will probably cost uh, at 80 pounds a square foot uh, just on 2 million. Uh, but that will be uh, uh, the return on that will probably, oh, we haven't worked that out yet. So I needn't try to answer it. It's something that we aspire to at the moment. We are going to use temporary warehousing in the meantime, which is relatively cheap and will be done for under 200,000. And that in itself will, will generate uh, a one year return. And we have a question from Roy Edwards who asks, I may have missed this. Have you a view about expectations for half two and therefore the full year? <laughs> I thought we put that, yeah. I thought our, our aspiration were to, to hit the 60 million mark, the 7%, and uh, but we're, we're still aspiring to that. And uh, we have, other than just refer to it as an aspiration, I mean, a lot of things can happen between this and the end of the year, but we would hope to hit, uh, hit those figures. Can you elaborate on the inventory position and the mix in the reported inventories between hygiene, other, and between raw materials, or finished goods, and are the NHS requiring you to hold inventory? Uh, I'll move that to Paul. Yeah, and um, the, the main the main increase year on year in inventory is hygiene related at the year end, where we've brought items in for the um, con NHS contract and others. Um, the NHS contract was um, originally um, uh, over a six month period. Um, but they were overstocked and it suited us uh, when they looked at uh, extending the delivery time horizon for us to do that. It meant we could get out of our night shift earlier and reduce our overheads. But what had, that did mean at the end of September, a lot of the items we'd bought to meet that demand um, were in, in our warehouse at the end of September. So as that get, contract gets completed by the end of next month, the end of January, some of that, or a lot of that hygiene related stock will come down. There is some of the hygiene that we bought speculatively on the branded side, on the retail side, that will take a little bit longer to clear. Um, the, the, so a lot of it's packaging, um, there are some raw materials again, where we bought forward in, in anticipation well, to meet the demand when we expected a tighter time horizon for the contract. But again, those will fall fall away um, the, the, as the um, as the, um, the the sales um, get delivered over the next few months. I think it's fair to say most of these, apart from any printed materials, labels, etc., are um, relatively common raw materials and components, and they can be. Um, if we, you know, it may take us a little bit longer to clear them, but they are items that should be reallocated and cleared to other product ranges over a period. Thank you. And Hank Veerman asks, there's a sizable net cash position expected towards the end of the year, especially as working capital reverses. What kind of brand are you looking to purchase or which product, um, which product category has your preference? Uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll have that to Pippa first of all. If I don't agree with her, I'm going to contradict her. <laughs> <laughs> um, in one of the categories that we would continue, or I would definitely continue, is in the skincare category. 
um, whether that's a specialist brand or a premium brand. But skincare continues to perform. It performed incredibly well during COVID. Balance has performed very well for us. If there was an opportunity to buy another skincare brand, that would be towards the top of my agenda. And I guess the second priority in all of that would be some sort of well-being brand. Now, whether that sat within skincare, whether that was a derma brand and extended towards the body, but had a, as I explained before, I think a brand that has got a very strong story, I think that would definitely be a focus because the consumer is now looking to buy into brands that can take them on a journey and can provide a really strong story. So, yeah, for me, it would be skincare or it would be within the well-being space and something with a really strong story. That wouldn't negate other areas. I think, you know, if something came along in the self-tan area, that would be interesting. Um, would definitely, definitely look at that, um, particularly if it had a nice story behind it. Um, so, yeah, not mutually exclusive to those categories, but they would probably be the ones at the top of the list. Thank you. And Dan Carroll asks, do you expect hygiene sales to persist as a category after this year or is it more of an opportunistic category? Um, well, clearly it's, oh, well, sorry. Yeah, go, go I, mean, I mean, it has been, it clearly has been an opportunistic category because of COVID and because of the pandemic. Um, as I alluded in earlier in my presentation, this category to, traditionally has been a very low value, very low margin category. Um, it's sort of come into its own through the, the trading opportunities, if you like, that COVID has, has put on us over the past few months. Will it continue beyond? It will not continue, in my view, at the levels that it had. The market is completely overstocked. It's flooded. Um, like I said, you know, talking to retail buyers about hygiene is very challenging. They've all got hygiene fatigue. They're all overstocked. The NHS is absolutely overstocked. It's got warehouses full of the stuff. Um, on the upside, I know that um, a lot of the stuff that we've been producing has been diverted to the vaccination centres, and the vaccination centres are perhaps going to create some demand moving through, albeit I doubt it will be at the levels that it had been when it was supporting the peak of lockdown. Um, interestingly, in the period, we've won a couple of contract manufacturing um, pieces of business with some premium brands that have moved into premium hygiene. And I think that's a very interesting development. Of course, it won't be at the volumes that um, we've seen and experienced with regard to the NHS and mass market. But I think it's a very interesting MPD development into the category that I think is probably going to drive some really nice margin for those brands and for us as a manufacturer, if we can target those types of brands. Um, but yes, in terms of mass and in terms of how the category looks right now, I don't see it continuing at the level that it has in any, unless... I unless another pandemic hits us that nobody saw us yeah. being sideswiped with. Well, we, we saw it previously on the, on the SARS uh, uh, way back a few years ago where we, we manufactured gels and they, they, they had about a three-month uh, life. life and then it all went dead again. People don't want it. You, you know, the consumer, the average consumer just doesn't want to be thinking about it. They want to throw their masks away and, and forget about having to, to do all this hygiene stuff. Um, Absolutely, fed up with it myself. So I can I understand where everybody's coming from. I don't think it, if somebody offered me a brand now that was hand gel or hand wash related, no. I wouldn't even give it five minutes. So no, um, absolutely not. It's not there. It's not going to be part of the future for us. And just to extend that, the opportunity for us is going to be in manufacturing for private label. There are absolutely quite significant private label briefs coming through in the gel hygiene category, but that is to replace either what they've got or upgrade what they've got. And now that we've got the facilities and capabilities to do these, these products successfully, we can now play in that space, which we wouldn't have done previously. So I think there will be a spin-off for us, but it will be in manufacturing for private label. Thank you. And a question from David Royal. Have you considered using the vacant site for expanding production facilities and fully outsourcing logistics or warehousing? Our aim is to... Uh, um is to be able to produce twice as much in the same area, the same footprint as we're doing now by investing in automation because it reduces the number of people. You've less risk. If ever a pandemic hits again, we won't have 400 people to do a 60 million turnover. We'll have 400 people to do 100 million turnover or we'll have 30 to do 60, whatever. But um, we want to reduce the footprint and the numbers employed by increasing automation. So that that's really the approach on 
on production, machinery, and all the rest. In terms of warehousing, yeah, we want to bring back our third party pick and packing. We want to get in direct. We want to reduce transportation costs. We want to be uh, want to move for sustainability and environmentally uh, appropriate uh, transportation. Um, if 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 all went well, I'd I'd want to be in a position to sell off part of the site in a few years' time. But we haven't got our act together enough yet to see exactly where we're going uh, and how automated we can become uh, and how efficient we bec can become with third-party warehousing and also how good we can become with our uh, uh, web-based uh, digital uh, um, performance, both in, in, in increasing brands and putting them on the, the web. Uh, so all of those things come into will come into focus and we, but Increasing the the space in which we manufacture that's not one of our things uh, unless we unless we move into manufacturing supplements or some which I wouldn't mind or some medical products which I wouldn't mind with bigger margins but right now we're focused on doing the best we can in this particular sector. Thank you. And Freddie had asks if there were a substantial fall in the value of the pound versus other principal currencies, do you see that overall as positive for international sales or will raw material import costs escalation negate that? Uh, oh, I, I think uh, it will be a, a, an adverse for us overall, but I think it will be negated by cheaper, uh, cheaper costs on raw materials and components. Would you like to comment on that, Ivan or Paul? I mean, the, 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 the fall in the pound against the dollar and the euro will both hurt us in terms of imports because it will cost us more to, 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 to bring um, uh, items into the UK that we consume. It will give us an advantage, as you've said, on the sales side. Um, and um, we could take advantage of it. We're well positioned because we've got trading relationships in the EU. Um, and we have, um, and we have, um, you know, now geared up to be able to service companies out of Germany within the EU should that be re be necessary. So we positioned ourselves to take advantage of uh, of both. We do have um, um, a net euro spend exposure, so the short term will be an increase in costs and a longer term possible sales opportunity. And our, our dollars is currently been a, a net dollar exposure, but that was largely related to bringing lots of pumps in related to the hygiene products. Um, and we are not as heavily exposed on the dollar as we are on the uh, the euro. So the, there will be short term cost increases, but there will, as you've said, longer term sales opportunities. And uh, we can still, you know, the, the, the building on British toiletry products is um internationally i'm sure people will correct me here it's still you know british made toiletry products are still a, an advantage when going out into international markets i think the u.s market is very influential and in where we will go and what the benefits will be or not be at the moment we're just waiting like a cat on, on a mouse you know waiting to pounce but it, it's not the right place to be right now for us but it has been in the past we've been very successful in the usa in the past and we, I think we've got brands that will be attractive in the U.S. market when things settle down and becomes more rational and predictable. Would you agree, Pippa? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And leading on from that, David Strader asks, are you seeing any growth in any particular export markets or has it slowed off due to the COVID challenges? Um, the biggest growth has still come from the Middle East. Um, that market has definitely stood up. Um, that's yeah, that's probably the, the easy and short answer to that. The Middle East has probably well, been Scandin the one. The Scandin rest, of, the rest of, quite... yeah, Scandinavia has been good. They were hit initially because they had store closures, but they've picked up very well. Um, we've got a key customer out there that actually goes across multiple markets in the EU that it's doing very well, um, and we're still doing quite well in a key market in South America that didn't seem to get hit at all actually. Um, which is interesting. Um, so yes, the key global markets that we're in have, have definitely stood up. And another question from David. If you manage to do 25 million in web sales, will that be done using your own facilities, i.e. warehousing and logistics, or by third parties? 
at the moment, we, we use a different third party picker and packer and we have, uh, to do our web, uh, to facilitate our web sales. Um, it's a new move for us. Uh, we, we would, we would uh, certainly bring it back in house if it doesn't work out well. But when we talk about bringing back third party picking and packing, it's really to our bricks and mortar customers that we're focusing on that. Uh, our web sales don't account for that much to be too concerned about it at the moment. But if it reaches 25 million and it makes sense to do it, then we'll do it. Uh, but I think that we would hope that our third party picker and pipe, there's, there's a lot more professionalism in the, in the web picking and packing than there is in the, uh, in, in the uh, bricks and mortar picking and packing for, uh, as far as we can see anyway. So David, there's no, there, there are no plans to, make sure that's in-house, but it wouldn't be beyond us to do it. We've done it before. We can do it again. We have a few more questions, but I think we've run out of time. Bernard, do you have any closing remarks? No, I, just to say that we intend to do better next year than we did this year, and we did a good job. I think we did a good job for our shareholders and investors. For all our stakeholders, we, we paid a good, a good bonus to all our employees. Uh, we give them extra money to come in during the in the early part of COVID. So for all the stakeholders in the company, I think we've, we've, we've done reasonably well. We don't want to overpraise ourselves, but we intend to do better. And, and we want to thank all our shareholders for uh, sticking with us, for having confidence in us, and for continuing to invest with us. And if they can bring any of their friends along to invest even more, that would be great. But thank you very much, everybody, for coming along and listening to us.